I'm trying a little something different with my sound setting, so hopefully it works out pretty well and it's not awful. Welcome back everyone to How Fast to Max. This is episode 28, and I'm trying to get this out as fast as possible because I want to do a live episode tomorrow when the new quest launches. The quest regarding the Elder God Wars. But for now, let's look at our stats. We are very close to 99 archaeology. Maybe we'll get it this episode. Also, if you came to this video from the recommended page and you're not subscribed, I would appreciate it if you subscribed. Anyway, let's stop shilling for ourselves and continue on with this. We have quite a lot of penguin points and I'm going to use all of the XP on runecrafting. That may seem like an odd choice, but leveling up runecrafting before you can do soul runes is kind of tedious and even soul runes aren't that great, but it's better than the other options and soul runecrafting is pretty quick. You might say, oh, use it on herb lore or prayer because those are expensive. I don't want to do that because I feel that making money is better than training runecrafting. And from that, we got 85 runecrafting. What's frustrating with hunting penguins is that to find the ghost penguin, you need to remember to bring your ring of visibility with you. But after you do some certain quests, you can return to Sliske after missing presumed death in the Empyrean Citadel. Sliske will basically infuse the ring of visibility into your character so you can see into the shadow realm without needing the actual ring. It's convenient, so if you happen to find the invisible penguin just randomly, you won't need the ring with you. I mean, if you didn't have the ring with you and you didn't have this ability, you wouldn't be able to see the penguin anyway, so you wouldn't really miss it, but you would actually miss it because it was there, but you couldn't see it, but you wouldn't know that you couldn't see it because you didn't have the ring of visibility with you. Now, you'll always have it with you, but you don't have to wear it. So if you do miss the penguin, it's your own fault. With 98 archaeology, we can excavate Hellfire Qatar from the Byzoth remains. If we bring two Hellfire Qatar to that demon in the center of the Infernal Source, he will give us a relic. The Rings of Razalei. From this relic, we unlock the Persistent Rage Relic Power. Our adrenaline will no longer drain outside of combat. Now, there are plenty of ways to avoid adrenaline drain outside of combat, such as using abilities like Freedom or Anticipation or Surge to keep our adrenaline from dropping, but now we can leave combat with full adrenaline and enter combat again with full adrenaline. It's very convenient, especially if you're doing clue scrolls, i found. You'll always have full adrenaline when you fight a double agent. Another useful relic we can get requires us to use a Throboshan banner and a Gargushan anchor. I think those are the names of the artifacts. I don't know. Goblins speak weirdly. So you bring a Throboshan banner to the northern opening here. And because they didn't want to animate anything, you just kind of wait around until you do the actions inside the hole in the wall. You know, they, they could have made an animation and showed us doing stuff, but nope. You emerge with a portion of the relic, the Red Hand Cave Painting. Likewise, you take the Gargushan Anchor to the southern hole in the wall and receive the other portion of the relic, the Green Skull Cave Painting. By combining them, you get the full relic, the Goblin War Paints. This is one of the best PVM relic powers, apparently. It is the Fury of the Small, and it increases adrenaline gain from basic abilities by 1%. I could see why that would be very effective when killing bosses. More adrenaline means more thresholds, and more thresholds means more damage. I was taking a bit of a break from archaeology and decided to do some fishing for the act track, and I got enough pieces to make one outfit of the shark outfit. Pretty exciting. Not only does this outfit give you a 5% increased fishing chance, but it also gives you the option to eat fish instead of catching them. Basically, it's like power fishing, but you don't have to drop anything. It's just a way to be lazy, and damn it, I like that. I had enough materials to make some trumpets. We made one trumpet and got 99 archaeology, but no one came to my 99 party. I didn't have one, but no one came anyway. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to unlock the Guildmaster rank just yet because I still needed to excavate and restore about a hundred more artifacts. I opted to use this location because there's a deposit box right near it, meaning I don't have to waste porter charges at such a low archaeology spot. You could argue I'd get more artifacts faster if I were at the level 1 spot, but the deposit box for materials for the level 1 spot is in an inconvenient location, it's a lot further away than this one, and since I don't want to waste porter charges, I'm going with this one instead. But it didn't take all that long anyway, and I was able to disassemble all of those artifacts for some lovely classic components so we can make more gizmo shells later. But we are now the Guildmaster, which means we have access to the Guildmaster shop, which includes the Elite Skilling Outfit. It is a very good skilling outfit. 
Some would argue that I should get the tier 99 Matic first by spending the 250,000 Chronotes on that. I disagree. I mean, frankly, I could just buy a bunch of Chronotes and get both. But I don't think the Matic of Time and Space is nearly as good as the outfit. Not only does the outfit provide teleports to everywhere, including the collectors, but look at all these other bonuses the outfit has. It increases your excavation success, it increases your precision, increases your speed when making artifacts, you sift soil faster, it's just loads better. By boosting with an archaeology potion from 99 to 102, we can restore an Orthan glass flask. Why are we doing this? Well, you see it's a requirement for a new relic. After restoring the flask, we add a piece of dragon metal to it. East of the Corbicula Rex hunting spot is this pool. We use its waters to fill the flask. We then use the flask to create a sort of potion. We add an Arbuck leaf, a sweet honeycomb, and a guarana fruit. This then creates the relic Soma. We offer this relic to the obelisk and it unlocks the relic power, Flow State. This relic increases our archaeology excavation precision by 20% at the expense of receiving no soil. So when we return to training archaeology, this is the relic we'll be using. I have a ton of raw sharks in my bank, and we happen to have a yak track that requires us to cook 1200 raw sharks, so we're gonna do that. The yak track told us to burn some logs, and I have no idea what's going on here at Shanty Pass, but there's a bunch of people with 120 capes... I... maybe waiting for a sacrifice? I... I don't know. I don't know what's happening. I'm intimidated. Anyway. Although I haven't been very consistent with Reaper tasks, I've been consistent enough for us to be able to get 505 boss kills and unlock the Altar of War ability cooldown reset. It resets ability cooldowns. It it's, does what it says on the tin. It also resets the healing ability from the Enhanced Excalibur, but it doesn't reset the Elven Ritual Shard, which is... interesting. I guess one's an ability and the other one isn't. It's time to run through a bunch of quests, and we're going to start by finishing up the Desert Quests, the Menaphos Quests, with Fight Club, where we finally take out the Pharaoh. This quest disappointed me. You defeat the Pharaoh, and I guess Jagex didn't know where they were going to take it, so it kind of turns into a, oh, I've been corrupted, woe is me, I've seen the light now that I've been defeated, blah blah blah, and then Osman just shows up and kills him, because I guess he's the Pharaoh now? I mean, yeah, I probably wasn't paying that much attention to this quest, but frankly, it didn't grab my attention the first time I did it, the second time I did it, or the third time. These quests suck. On an Iron Man, I would have done this quest immediately, because you get access to a weekly D&D &D that provides you with bonus XP. With this quest complete, every week we could fight Agaroth twice, and the reward is two black pearls, which we can use to get bonus XP in a skill of our choice. In Pyronid is a very useful quest for Iron Man as well, because it unlocks another D&D, &D, which we can do every day where we kill a phoenix and get firemaking, fletching, and crafting XP. We also get five phoenix quills, which can be used to craft reborn phoenix pouches, which makes fire making faster. I believe it's a 7% chance for you to burn two logs in a bonfire. If I'm not mistaken, that works out to be a 7% XP boost. Olaf's quest is a quest I usually do much earlier because it gives quite a decent amount of defense experience, but I just never got around to it. I forgot to record the quest complete screen because I accidentally closed it by reading that note in my inventory. So, uh... Quest complete. Love story, we're going to hang out with the wise old man once again. During this fight, I ended up just taking off my armor because I was getting frustrated switching back and forth between ranged and mage. I thought the fight was going to be harder because I remember doing this quest at lower levels when it was harder, but I'm like level 130 something, so... Or 128, or I, I don't even know. It was, it was easy. We can now chip teleport to house tablets so we can teleport to any of the house portals without putting our house at that portal. After the quest, if you're interested in the master quest cape, you need to chop this guy out of the tree and he gives you 5k as a reward. You need to come to this guy in Keldegrim and get a diary from him and bring it to the wise old man so he'll teach you how to chip tablets to go to Trollheim. This can be very convenient if you're on lunar spells and need to teleport to Trollheim. Unless you have the teleport to Trollheim lunar spell unlocked from Livid Farm, then this is dead content. And finally, you have to bring the ring back to Mabel, who started this whole quest, and she will give you a 10k XP lamp, which we used in agility for some reason and not runecrafting, I don't know why. Now we have 400 quest points, which means we can get our final reward from May's quest caravan. Will it be a die? Let's find out. Eh, well. 
The sixth quest in the Pirate Quest series is A Clockwork Syringe. I don't know if I love or hate the Pirate Quest line. The humor is good, and the story is good, but together they kind of clash. Hey, they added a new skill. Boating. Completing the quest gives us a pirate spell sheet that allows fast transportation between Brain Death Island and Mostly Harmless. I've never used it, and I have no plans of ever using it. You know, I know the character of Sliske is supposed to be sort of this overbearing, sort of harlequin kind of thing, but I don't know, he's kind of tropey, you know what I mean? It's a little cliche. And this part of the quest kind of baffles me. He's mad because we discovered a secret, so he just beats us up, and we just kind of take it. My first thought was, why doesn't he use his powers? But since we're the World Guardian, I guess that prevents it? But it just kind of makes us look like a chump, you know? And then at the end of Sliske's Endgame, we sort of... <laughs> well, now I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that later. I like quests that give XP and multiple skills, and it's all the same amount of XP. Room Mechanics is a quest, and now it's completed. I took a break from questing and decided to do some temple trekking and got all of our followers to max level. So that's all six followers to 99, which means we have 594 total level amongst all of them. We can claim a ghast pouch, summon it, and complete the achievement there. We can go ahead and AFK at Deep Sea Fishing and get 91 fishing, return to Mauritania with an Admiral Pie, and fish barehanded until we get a shark. With that done, we can now claim our elite Mauritania legs, which are fantastic for Iron Man, and I'll explain why. First, when operated, we can teleport to the Ectofunctus Slime Pit 20 times per day. Robin will convert 39 sets of bones per day. We get double mushrooms from the Canifus and Isifdar mushroom patches, that's very good. The Big Book of Piracy has a charge cap of 60 charges, and also we could see Mune on Thursdays or whatever, that's a pet, who gives a damn. Most importantly, when worn, we get 50% more firemaking and prayer experience from cremating vire corpses, including with the Sun Spear. We also get more Slayer XP in the Slayer Tower, and we have a 20% chance of creating a 4-dose prayer renewal potion instead of a 3-dose. Vire Watch are great for Iron Man, and if we can increase the XP, they're even better. Of course, this account isn't an Iron Man, so it's not that important. It's not that big of a deal, I could just buy bones and sacrifice them on an altar. If I were an Iron Man, I'd probably be using these XP lamps on Herblore or Agility, but I use it on Crafting instead. And since we did a Clockwork Syringe, that means we can finish up the Hard Dungeoneering task set and claim that reward as well. The secondary roll on our ring is increased to 75%. We have access to two more Bind Pool slots, a 5% reduction in the cost of recharging items, 10% increased rewards from sinkholes, that's pretty good and access to the extended portion of the Dwarven Mine Hidden Mine containing Phasmatite Rocks, which we will never use. With 99 Archaeology, we actually have access to another relic, which a friend, Dovidas, talked about in a video recently. We basically bring a death mask to Bob the Cat, and he gives us Evil Bob's Cat Paw. This is a reference to the old random event where Evil Bob would kidnap you, and you'd have to uncook some fish to feed it to him. The reason why this is a reference to that is because the relic power that this relic grants is bait and switch. Fishing produce are cooked when caught. Everything you fish that can be cooked will be cooked, and you'll get 50% of the experience you would have gotten if you had cooked the fish on a fire. It's great for Iron Man, but you need at least 96 archaeology for it. Because RuneScape Mobile released, and I was using the beta for a short amount of time, I was rewarded with the Founders Pack, or whatever they call it, which is basically just a bunch of cosmetics and a 50% XP boost for about a week, I think it is. So we can think of it like a mini double XP weekend, except it's one and a half times instead of two times. So I'm here in ED3 trying to get 90 strength, because that is one of the last skills I need to get to 90. You'll notice I have a different weapon. It is a Dragon Rider Lance. It only cost me about 34 mil. And I think the price of it decreased significantly recently because of the Guardian's Gift reward that Jagex gave out, which pretty much let people get Aftershock 4 for free, so there was less need for Ilujunkin components, or Ilujunkin components, whichever way you want to say it. I like the Soft J, personally. But since there was no more requirement for it, the demand for Dragon Rider Lances dropped, but the supply didn't change much. Basic economics. And as a result, it was a perfect time to buy. So I did. And now I have one. Maybe at some point in the future I'll disassemble it, or maybe I'll remove the augmentation and upgrade to a noxious scythe. But what I do in the future isn't relevant, because right now I'm just trying to get 90 strength. 
Ever the frenetic RuneScape player, I took a break from ED3 for a bit at 88 strength, I think it was around 88 strength, because I was getting bored. And I opted to go to runecrafting because that wouldn't be boring at all, would it? Well, it turns out you can do soul runecrafting before level 90. You just need an extreme runecrafting potion or just a super runecrafting potion. Any runecrafting potion that gets you to 90, really. Because you can charge the altar perfectly fine without the required level. You only need that level to craft the runes. So I charged up the altar, grabbed my demonic skull, and went to the soul altar through the abyss. And with all the bonuses and everything, I got 137,000 XP. Mind you, the demonic skull and bonus XP don't stack, at least not the way you would expect them to. So that's basically, that's the XP you could expect to get on an Iron Man, believe it or not. It's ridiculous. It takes about 15 minutes to charge the altar to full so you can get that big XP drop, but it's super AFK and it's a very chill way to train. It's not too bad. I might do this for a while. So I got 90 room crafting from Soul Runes. That actually held my attention better than ED3 did. Go figure. But I still had to return to ED3. We still needed to get 90 strength. We want to have 90 base and everything, and strength is a skill we need to get to 90. So let's get it to 90. Okay, we got it to 90. The last skill we need to get to 90 is Dungeoneering. It didn't take very long, but we got it to 90. 90 Dungeoneering also means we can use the Demon Horn Necklace. We can kill Calgarian demons, and we have a new ports adventurer. Back to questing. Children of Ma. We finally learned the origins of the Ritual of Rejuvenation, and we get some backstory about the Majorat. So Jagex must play this game, right? The people who design this game must play it. Right? They have to. But this part of the quest it makes me wonder if any of them have ever seen the game. This part sucks. It just doesn't work. Like, mechanically, everything works correctly. Yeah, yeah, but that's not what I mean. It's just, it doesn't work in this game. It's clunky. These are different controls. It's not how the game's supposed to be played. It's just, it's weird. It's like when you play, I don't know, uh, a platformer, and then suddenly you get thrown into a first-person shooter. It's just, it doesn't make sense. Do one thing well. Don't do a bunch of things poorly. This is one thing they're doing poorly. With the quest complete, we have a tome of XP with three chapters to use, each chapter giving 100,000 XP. I used all three on Dungeoneering, which may seem weird, why didn't I use it on, say, Agility or Herblore or something like that? Well, Herblore is already 99, and Agility is pretty much buyable. Dungeoneering is not. The ultimate quest in the Pirate Quest line, Pieces of Hate. We are finally going to confront Rabid Jack. I don't have much to say about the final boss of this quest. It was... okay. It wasn't too hard, wasn't too easy. I mean, obviously it won't be too hard for me because I have tier 90 weapons. I can imagine it being pretty difficult for an Iron Man using, say, a Sun Spear, who's somewhere around, like, level 110. Could be difficult. I know the next thing we have to do is difficult for an Iron Man around level 110, 120, with only a Sun Spear. Actually, I don't mean the next thing, I mean the next next thing. This thing here is me changing from female to male, just because, I don't know, I got a little tired of the female character model, and, I don't know, I wanted a beard. I mean, the only reason why I was a female was because the recruitment drive quest, I made the character a female just so we didn't have to change in the middle of the quest. I just never bothered to come to the makeover mage. Until now. We want to do Curse of the Black Stone. The quest requires that we complete all three of the elite dungeons, beating the final boss. The idea during the quest is that you go from dungeon to dungeon completing them, during the quest, or you can complete them before the quest because the quest came out after all three were released. Actually, this quest came out the day the third one was released. Fortunately, you can also do it on story mode, and story mode is super easy. It's just annoying if all you have is a sun spear and you have to fight Sayuryu, the dragon. That fight, that encounter, it's very, very annoying because you have to do 75,000 damage to the crystals with the sun spear. It, uh, you know what, I'm not even going to complain. Let's just speed through the bosses, and then get on with the quest. This is all story mode, by the way. Okay?
Since we did all three elite dungeons before starting this quest, this quest ends up basically being a walking simulator. We just talk to one person, and then talk to another person, then run somewhere else and talk to a third person. Quite easy. There's actually some funny dialogue with Brill if you complete all of the elite dungeons before you finish the quest. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but she's kind of miffed that she put in all this effort and you just went and defeated the ambassador on your own. And we get three huge XP lamps from the quest, which we use on Dungeoneering. What a surprise. The final free-to-play quest we have to do is Broken Home. The rewards from the replays of this quest are actually pretty good, especially if you're an Iron Man and you need XP. You can get a free huge XP lamp every week. Of course, completing this quest once doesn't mean we're done with it. We need to re-enter the mansion and complete the three challenges. Complete the quest without dying, without using more than one piece of food, and in under 37 minutes. But because I've done this quest multiple times, I was able to complete it in under 26 minutes while getting all of the XP lamps, except for one because I'm an idiot, from the temporal chests. So we get the Asylum Surgeon Ring, which is a Master Clue Emote Clue requirement, but also a pretty decent ring. And we also get a huge XP lamp for completing all three challenges. Guess what skill we're going to use it on? That's right, Dungeoneering. All of them go to Dungeoneering. Much like Curse of the Black Stone, Sliske's endgame is very difficult if all you have is a Sun Spear, no Overloads, or Soul Split. Needless to say, I have tier 90 weapons, so it's not going to be that bad. But the maze is awful. There is nothing about it that's engaging or fun. It's just tedious and annoying. I... This quest wouldn't even be that long if it weren't for the maze. Cut the maze out and the quest is like, what? 15 minutes? Maybe? Maybe a half hour? Eh. I'm very salty today. All things said, the final fight wasn't too bad. The Nomad Grigorovich and Linza fight was pretty easy. I couldn't do it the first time around because I didn't have enough supplies with me because I did it immediately after finishing the maze and I just wasn't equipped for it. I did die once to Sliske because I didn't get him off the platform fast enough, I wasn't sure what to click, and I got stuck in a bunch of lightning. I'm curious why our World Guardian power is activated here, but didn't activate during Kindred Spirits when he was beating the snot out of us. Perhaps the World Guardian powers are simply plot powers. They don't exist unless the plot needs them to exist. And with that quest completed and Sliske dead and totally not alive somewhere inside us right now, we get many rewards, including 5 XP lamps that give 250,000 XP each. Can you believe I'm using all of them on Dungeoneering? It's pretty wild when you think about it. Who would use XP lamps on Dungeoneering? That's so weird. Yeah, it is. But I want to get 95 Dungeoneering as soon as possible so I can have access to the Garajo Dungeon in Priftinus and finish the Elite Tyranin task set. And finally, we're going to do the underwhelmingly named Azanadros quest. It came out quite recently, this year in fact, and it is a continuation of the Elder Gods questline and all of the lore that comes with it. I really like this quest, but my one criticism is Trindine's dialogue. She didn't speak the way I would expect a millennia-old immortal to speak. It was very casual and modern and weird. But with Azanadros quest done, that's 418 quest points. That means we've done every single quest in the game, and we can get ourselves a quest cape. On my first RuneScape account, my first cape of achievement was the quest point cape. So it has a special place in my heart. I really like this cape. I think quests in this game are wonderful to do, even if some of them are absolute torture. But they are definitely worth doing, because the quests in RuneScape are unique among all quests in MMOs. Rather than killing 10 bears and collecting 10 pelts, we have a whole entire story where we gotta travel across the entire world to figure out what's going on. Of course, the Slayer skill is basically an MMO quest. Kill 115 Abyssal Demons, kill 200 Dark Beasts. And yet, it's everyone's favorite skill. I think people just like to see a number countdown. Anyway, thanks for watching. Take care.